The basic idea here is, <clears throat> is I understand that I'm supposed to talk about territory. So today is going to be Territory 101. It's going to be probably stuff that some of you already know very well. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, if I insult your intelligence, uh, my apologies. Uh, otherwise, it, it probably doesn't hurt to review some of this stuff. I don't know. I've been reading, reading this material for a long time, and I find it difficult. And I don't know if that's just my own challenge to burn. But uh, when, when I started working on Deleuze, I don't know, 25, too many years ago, uh, one of my goals was to understand every sentence. And uh, I still don't understand every sentence. But every once in a while, a new sentence will make, I'll be able to decipher. And so I hope that occasionally I will make uh, uh, in, uh, coherent to you something that previously was not coherent. Day one, I talk about territory. I'll start off with the general concept and uh, the, um, the only asked about readings, the only reading of any relevance at all is uh, Plateau 11 of a thousand plateaus on the refrain de la ritornelle. And that's going to be pretty much the first half. You remember the second half is essentially music history, where you go from classicism, romanticism, and then modernism. And we will touch on some of the, the, those issues, because ultimately, days two and three will be about music. Now, I've put this together. I have no idea how long this is going to go. We're already a half an hour late. I don't know. You know. Uh, I'll try to sort of pace things according to that little clock that I'm going to look at from time to time. But Wednesday, I'm going to talk about Olivier Messiaen, who, how many of you know who that is? Raise your hands high. All right, so I'm talking to people who don't know about Olivier Messiaen. There are two in the room. Okay, he's a, a, a French composer who died, born in 1908, who died in 1992. Uh, he is perhaps the most important composer for Deleuze and Guattari in the refrain plateau. And I think you'll see when we, after reviewing the description of territory, when we review things that Messiaen says about music, they, they lift all kinds of things right out of missing yeah. or shall we say they are uh, compatible uh, companions. Uh, and I'll conclude, but the, the emphasis will be on a specific piece of music. You've got to like Boiseau, uh, piece two from book, or piece three from book one, Le Merle Bleu, which uh, I didn't know in English is the blue rock thrush. That's the name of a bird. I asked uh, Katarina's mother this morning what it was. She speaks French. I don't know what it is in Portuguese. At any rate, we'll do that. And then the third day will be probably the least relevant to my topic. Uh, it will just be for my amusement. And that will be uh, Silvana Bussotti. Ian knows a little bit about this since he's seen the article that I've written on the opening image of a thousand plateaus on the uh, horizon. Some of you have looked at that crazy score. That's by Silvano Busotti. And the Deleuze and Guattari misspelled his last name. And the translator is very faithful and mistranslate and misspells the name also. There are two T's at the end, Busotti. Uh, and uh, I'll talk about that and John Cage and some other crazy stuff. So if I get there. But I'll try because I think it's, it's a lot of fun. OK. And it looks like uh, that's this. The battery just died. Okay, the battery just died. I did bring along extra batteries. I hope they're. I don't think they're in this bag. So, so much for all of this. Oh, boy. This is going to be no fun. Okay, I'm going to have to do everything from Control Central here. Are those double A or triple A? They're double A. Can't help you. Can't help me. <laughs> yeah, well, we knew. All right, so at any rate, here we are for that, and let's see, move on here. Uh, the first thing is when you hear this word territory, uh, you should realize that there are really two basic, con uh, basic notions of territory. The, the term itself appears for the first time in L'Antiedip, Anti Oedipus, 
And here's a, this is the general sense of the term. You've heard of territorialization, re-territorialization, deterritorialization. That's the big concept. Everything can be understood in terms of re-territorialization, deterritorialization. And the initial use of the uh, concept of territory, I think, is in that first of the three machines, the social machines that are outlined in chapter three of Anti-Oedipus. You remember there we have the primitive socius, we have the despotic, and then we have the capitalist. And the first of those is said to be a territorial machine. And here's a quote that um, it, it's lifted out of context and I could spend probably a half an hour talking about it, but I won't. The earth is the primitive, savage unity of desire and production. And remember, all the way through, earth, en français, c'est terre. So territoire, terre. There's always that very close link that gets you miss in English. Okay? Okay. Uh, for the earth is not merely the multiple and divided object of labor. And there they're talking sort of Marxian kind of talk, right? It is also the unique indivisible entity, the full body that falls back on the forces of production and appropriates them for its own as the natural or divine precondition. All that they're saying here is that in traditional societies, I don't use the word primitive, uh, they do so, I think, with humor. But it, we usually refer to these as hunter-gatherers, various you know, um, kinds of, uh, what, traditional societies is the word that I think is appropriate. But basically, there are, around the world, cultures in which it is said that the people belong to the earth, that they are emanated from it. The oct autonomous notion of, I mean, it's just a very common notion. Okay, and that they are the people and they belong to the earth and that the earth is one with them. And basically what they're saying is, if you're doing a traditional Marxist analysis of the mode of production, you do not have a separation of earth and all of the productive uh, uh, activities. Rather, they are all one that are a part of a single body. And of course, they will call it a body without organs, Later on, it will be something like a plan of consistency or whatever. At any rate, so this is the initial idea here that uh, the territorial machine, which would be the primitive machine or what I'm calling the traditional machine, would be one that, that is the first form of the socius, the machine of primitive inscription, the mega machine that covers a social field. The word mega machine they take from um, uh, Lewis Mumford. Uh, he wrote a book about machines, and uh, they cite this one instance where Mumford said the first mega machine was the uh, building of the pyramids in Egypt. And he said by the technical de definition of the machine of Brule, who is a, actually a German who wrote in the early 1900s, and he gives a definition. He says this counts as a machine. And what is the machine? It's the pharaoh. It's the uh, engineers, it's the workers, it's the pieces of stone, it's the pieces of wood that they roll the stone on, it's the quarry, it's the, the boat that takes them down. It's this huge uh, heterogeneous uh, interacting uh, collection of entities that is serving some kind of practical function. Okay? So that is what they mean by the mega machine. And that would be then the territorial machine, and that would be your largest sense of territorial applied to uh, the social world. The next social machine is the despotic machine, and it is said that what happens then is this coding, what happens is in a primitive society, if you read in chapter uh, the Plateau 5, when they talk about visagerte, faciality, they talk about the way in which in a primitive culture you have an interconnection of signs, but no centralization. In other words, you have an inscription of a, uh, you, you have a, 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 a tattoo that relates you to a particular clan. You have a relationship to a particular spirit somewhere. You have heterogeneous, multiple semiotic connections, but they do not all come back to a single signifier or a single source. Rather, they are more sort of polyvocal distributed. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. What happens, they say, with the despotic machine is the despot comes along, 
deterritorializes all those things, that is, uncodes all of those primitive connections with the earth, lifts them up, and then recodes them in terms of not the or a body of the earth, but the body of the despot. And when you do that, then you have a new kind of a, a, a new kind of socius, and it is re-territorialized. Okay, so that's sort of the basic idea of territory in that early model, and I hope you can see it's huge in its scale. Um, when we go to what is philosophy, 1991, you find a similar kind of use of the word territory in the fourth chapter, uh, geopolitics. Uh, and is it, is it geo, no, ge geophilosophy, sorry. Geophilosophy. The first sentence says, subject and object give a poor approximation of thought. Thinking is neither a line drawn between subject and object, nor a, re or a revolving of one around the other. Rather, thinking takes place in the relationship of territory and the earth. Territoire et terre. Okay? Basically, what they're saying is philosophy engages the socio-political context in which it is situated. They're talking of mostly, why is it that, that philosophy has its origin in Greece? And they, they uh, give an analysis arguing that there is a milieu of imminence that um, emerges in 5th century BCE Athens. And it is because it, that, that, that city is on the margin of empire it allows for a more horizontal kind of a structure. They make an opposition of the state structure, which is hierarchical, and the city, which is more horizontal, which allows for a freer kind of connection. They then talk about three different things that emerge at that point. I forget what they are. A love of opinion, the possibility of uh, social relations that are on a more uh, uh, egalitarian uh, basis. They can be positive friendship, but they can also be negative rivalry. And then a third one, I forget what it is. But at any rate, they say, this allows philosophy to take place. But once it takes place, what's crucial is that philosophy manages somehow to deterritorialize itself from the specificity of ancient Greek culture and reach something they call the, the earth. And there they're connecting it with the notion that philosophy's ultimate goal, same goal of the arts, the same goal of the sciences, is to invent a new earth and a new people. Un peuple à venir, a people to come, a new earth to come. In other words, it's a kind of a utopian project whereby you take your, your situation, where you are in, in, in specific terms, you manage somehow to disconnect your uh, investments in the specifics of your situation and then you manage to engage in philosophy, which, as you recall, is something that takes place on a plane of imminence. That is one that is uh, one of relative or absolute deterritorialization. And you do so such that you may possibly re-territorialize, but re-territorialize not in the place where you are, but in some kind of new, better world, as they say uh, in it's this Nietzsche who says that uh, in the antepestif, uh, the untimely, the main thing is against the past, for the present, in hope of a better future. You never know. You may end up worse at any rate. So at any rate, that's the big idea of territory. Now what I think happened when Deleuze and Guattari, when they're writing A Thousand Plateaus, is they finished A Thousand, uh, they finished anti-Oedipus, they talk all the time about territory, de of deterritorialization, re-territorialization, then, then the question occurs to them, well, what if we explored this notion of territory in a specific sense? What if we looked at it in terms of what is called ethology? Does everyone know what that word means? It looks like, it, I always pronounce it ethology, E-T-H-O-L-O-G-Y, but apparently, at least my dictionary says you say ethology. Everybody knows what ethology is? No. OK. I, you can raise hands. That's, that's OK. Uh, and if, or you can nod no, you know, something like that. Ethology is the science of, uh, of animal behavior. It's, in other words, it's an analysis not of physiological systems, morphogenetic systems, but how animals behave with one another. 
if you've read much Deleuze, you know that he says that Spinoza's ethics is really not an ethics, but an ethology, which is an interesting statement. In other words, it's a study not of what well, we'll traditionally think of as, as ethics, but of animal behavior, how we interact with one another. Ethology was, is usually credited with having its origin in the 1930s. Uh, Nicholas Tinbergen, Conrad Lorenz, and Jakob von Frisch are uh, the three researchers who are usually associated with this uh, thesis. I'm going to quote uh, someone with the name that is my, perhaps my, most, my favorite name in all the world. We'll get to it soon, I think. Okay, so uh, let's see, we move to this is the specific notion. And here, let's see if I've got his name up there. Territory according to ethologists. This is sort of in preparation. And there it is. Look at that name. Your analysis. I will, I will spend. I just love that, you know. Uh, my parents really failed me. <laughs> but a name like that, you've got to, well, you've either got to be a miserable failure. Uh, you know, beat up on the school uh, grounds or become an incredibly famous guy. This is the guy that Deleuze and Guattari cite all the time. And he wrote a 700-page textbook on ethology. He wrote a 700-page book, book on human ethology. Uh, so here is the definition of territory in the narrower sense. Ethologically, a territory is defined as a space in which one animal or a group generally dominates others which in turn may become dominant elsewhere. Domination can be achieved by diverse means, for example, by fighting threats, territorial songs, and olfactory markings. And if you've read the opening of uh, the refrain chapter, they talk about uh, animals that spray their scent. Um, and there are some animals that have special glands. Uh, rabbits have them that uh, excrete a certain kind of smell that's very powerful. And they go around the edges of their territory. Cats will spray their territory. And so, at any rate, uh, by these means, the territory owners usually banish those that do not belong to the group or any conspecific that is a fellow member of that species. That's what conspecific means, right? If it is solitary. Now, the next thing I wanted to point out here is that Deleuze Guattari do not take in the full range of territorial behavior. They treat primarily individual territoriality. In birds, for example, a male will try to uh, defend a territory from other males. Fish, a certain fish will they defend its territory from other fish. Sometimes it'll be the mating couple that will defend the nesting area. But there is a whole uh, a different uh, category, which is that of groups that maintain territories. And that would be packs, herds, clans, as they are defined in biology, and they defend the territory. Wolves, interesting, I think, considering we have the second plateau, uh, one or several wolves, right? Okay, so wolves are territorial animals, but they do not territorialize in the same way as those that are individual. When I give my talk at the conference, I'm going to make a big deal about this, or at least a small big deal. Uh, because what is interesting is what is called ritualization, we'll talk about this later, is only used in territorialization for individuals. It's never used for the groups, which is, I think, significant. We'll see, I'm going to talk about group movement uh, and its relationship to dance and war. Okay, but I just thought I'd let you know there is that distinction, and here's one map. This is a map of uh, four male damsel fishes. See, I can read too. And down below it tells you what the, the scale is. It says that uh, each fish was observed for five minutes. The area shown in the, in, in the drawing covers approximately 5, 6, 5 by 6 meters. The fish measures about 12 centimeters. How long is 12 centimeters? It's is it? three inches. Uh, okay. So they're going around, you know, you know, areas like this. And you can see that they intersect each other, but they tend to sort of push against each other and establish territory in that fashion. But here's a map of wolves in Yellowstone Park in uh, uh, Wyoming in the United States. And you'll see they overlap, but there it's the whole wolf pack. And there will be the packs are named. Uh, the Yellowstone Delta Pack, and you can't read these very well. Whatever. At any rate, you get the idea. Okay? All right. The next point. Let's see where we are here. 
Now, I'm going to move from this notion of territory to Deleuze, Guattari, and the refrain. Because the refrain is the concept whereby they come to the notion of territory. Okay? Now, I hope I'm not going to be uh, insulting your intelligence as I review these points, but this is page one of the refrain. They have one, two, and three moments. The first moment, and these are my labels, uh, but they are sort of drawn from Deleuze and Guattari. The first is, there is a point of order, and here is the quote, a child in the dark, gripped with fear, comforts himself by singing under his breath. The song is like a rough sketch of a calming and stabilizing, calm and stable center in the heart of chaos. Okay, so that's where they start, which is this chaos of fear and confusion, and then the establishment of something that serves as a kind of an anchor. And when it may be that you start humming. And you start to feel a little bit of, you know, like there's something here that's holding you together, pushing away those, those forces of chaos that are frightening you. Moment two, territorial circle. Eh, circle, but we mean bounded space. And it doesn't have to be a circle, it could be a square or whatever. And this is, now we are at home, but home does not pre-exist. It was necessary to draw a circle around that uncertain and fragile center to organize a limited space. So you start with that little bit, of that little point, and then from that point you are able to extend and if we were talking in terms of traditional biological, ethological, you would say you extend the, sp the sphere of your mastery of space-time, right? That is your area in which you feel some kind of control. Uh, and here they talk about uh, animals that mark their territory. Um, you could also think about the founding of cities. Uh, among the Romans, the first thing you would do when you founded a city was get out your plow you would plow the contour of the outside of the city, and that would be the founding of the city, and everything would take place within it. You'd have rituals and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so that's moment two. Moment three coming up is the line of flight. Finally, one opens the circle, a crack, not on the side where the old forces of chaos press against it. Okay, so it's not that you open back up to chaos. I think that's really important. But in another region, one created by the circle itself, as though the circle tended on its own to open onto a future. The basic idea behind all of this is every territory is always in communication with some other territory. There is always interterritorial interterritorial communication, you have to, and, and there is a sense in which territories are always deterritorializing themselves in that larger sense. Does that make sense? Whether you believe that's true or not, that's what they're claiming. And well, I'll talk a, a little bit more about this. So uh, this, is, this is a hard point. These are not three successive moments in an evolution. You would think they are, would be, don't, wouldn't you? Point, and then you get the order, and then you have, it sounds like it's one, two, three, and that's what they say. But they say, there are three aspects of a single thing, the refrain. The refrain has all three aspects. It makes them simultaneous or mixes them. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes. Now what I want to do is argue that the refrain chapter makes no sense if you sit too hard on that sentence. You need to sit on the sometimes, sometimes, sometimes as well. Why? Because the entire uh, chapter is organized around a clear distinction between those three moments. What you're going to find is the first moment of origin is going to give you milieu animals. The second moment, the territorial circle, is what's going to give you what ethologists would call, in the strict sense, territorial animals. And the third, the line of flight, 
will show you how the territorial animals can incorporate movement outside themselves or even deterritorialize themselves towards something else. And here I'm thinking in evolutionary terms. That is, it is quite possible that in the evolution of life forms on this planet, we will have territorial animals that will become less territorial, that will become much more nomadic or whatever. What Deleuze and Guattari want to avoid, obviously, however, is a strictly evolutionary model. That is, whereby one necessarily goes from a or one to two to three. What they want to argue, I think, is that those three moments exist in a virtual realm. That is, they are always present. However, they are not always actualized to the same extent. That is, when you're in a milieu animal, there's still, you know, I guess we would say, latent or possible within that territory, <coughs> certain I mean, within that milieu, things like territoriality, line of flight. When you're in the territory, there are still milieu elements in line of flight. In the line of flight, there are milieu and territory, okay? So they want to avoid any kind of a, well, for them, a simple-minded kind of evolutionary model. For one thing, because it is a theory of time that is essentially chronometric and avoids the whole question of the, un the what is it, the unpulsed flux time of ion, uh, of where it's the time of the infinitive, it's the time of pure becoming. So, at any rate, the second reason that you need to have this distinction of one, two, and three is when they get to the sec second half of the refrain, one is classical, neoclassical, or rather, I'm sorry, no, Viennese classicism. And that would be Mozart, Haydn, early Beethoven, those kinds of composers. Two, romantic composers. And those are the composers of the earth. And they are the composers of territory. And they make a big deal about the fact that uh, in romantic music you have a movement towards nationalism, the establishment of national musics, such as the Bourjac, you have Chopin for the, Poli for the, 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 uh, the Polish, you have Grieg for the Norwegian, right? Uh, and uh, Sibelius for the Finns. Who else do we have in there? Uh, uh, Liszt for the Hungarians. They're all interested in reviving a sense of national identity. And you can see that's a kind of a territorial idea. And then they cite um, uh, Mahler's The Song of the Earth as sort of the penultimate conclusion of this movement. And you remember in, uh, well, you'll see. Um, the, the forces of the earth are what, what are manifested in this middle thing. And then the third moment, movement, which is uh, the uh, modern music, is the cosmic moment, and that's the line of flight moment. So you really need these distinctions, even though they say they're all there at the same time. Have I made myself clear? Okay, good. All right. So here is the... Uh, Towards the, there's a summary at the end of the second page of a thousand of, of the refrain chapter, in which they talk, they sort of make these parallels, that, and they go down. Okay, so the point of order, they say, is an infra assemblage. It has directional components, and it harnesses the forces of chaos. Okay. The circle of territory has intra-assemblages. It has dimensional components, so directional, dimensional, and its forces are terrestrial. And you see how that works in with that notion of romantic music and uh, territory and the first forces of the earth and all that kind of stuff. And then finally, the line of flight, inter-assemblage, passage or escape components. Doesn't quite fit in as well, does it? <laughs> and then finally, cosmic forces. And that's the modern era. And that's where, uh, in, in music, and I'll try to relate that later. So what I want to do now is explain to you what infra-directional and dimensional might mean. Because for a long time, I just read those and I thought, what the hell does this mean? I, really, I didn't have a clue. And it's only recently I think I figured it out. OK, so infra. I had to look up something. And here's my message. There's infra. 
infra means from it means below or from beneath. You know, infrared, right? So what is an infra assemblage? It is that emergence of the point of of order, which then allows something to happen. And there's my point of order emerging from a sea of chaos. <laughs> I like it. At any rate, <laughs> yeah, I know it's 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 pretty silly. But, but also, it reminds me of that great image um, in, in the letter to Konichi Uno, where Deleuze says that Watari is like the ocean, infinite creativity, and he's kind of like a little hill or the island that rises yeah. above us. I think the image works nicely. All right. Well, and we also have Il Désert, yeah. <laughs> you know, and the whole thing about islands, and Deleuze is fascinating with that. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so now I want to explain why this is directional. That was something else I didn't understand, and I think I understand that. Okay, so what happens is a point of order emerges. Uh, oh, went that far. Uh, the drama has been spoiled. Okay, and here we have, obviously, just the three dimensional you know, Cartesian coordinates. Basically, these are just the coordinates of the x, y, and z axes. But the way I want you to see them is as vectors. That is, lines of motion, OK? So what happens when you establish a point of order? You establish a certain kind of orientation. And that orientation is a vectoral orientation. And the way I make sense of this is to say, first, we have our corporeal orientation. And Deleuze is very big on this notion that um, that we have a, what is it, a um, spatium, and a, what's the next one? In, in different Extension. Pardon? Extension, okay? And the spatium is spacing, spacing itself. It's a kind of a primordial, primordial depth. Before you have orientation, it's close to this idea of chaos. It's not quite the same thing. But his idea is that the, that the givenness of of the spatial coordinate world is that spatium that spaces itself. And I see this as a kind of unfolding of a realm where you don't have left, right, up, down, front, back. And then once you do, then you have these vectoral components of your establishment in space. <coughs> and most of us have a sense of what's down, what's up, what's back, behind us, what's in front, right? The ventral, the dorsal the left, the right. And from those, we can extend them to a geographical sense of directionality. That would be east, west, north, south, altitude, or you know, height, depth. OK? Is this clear? I, I think that's why he says that these are directional. Now, the next phase is to move to the territorial circle, which is, to remember, dimensional. And it says it is intra-assemblage. Uh, and all, I mean, all that would mean is it's a structuring of elements inside that territory. That would be intra, right? Intraspecific, intraspecific relations are the relations among individuals of a signal species. Inter would be among more than one species. And remember, when we get to line of flight, that's inter assembled. So this is intra. And this one, I don't have any good picture for. You. But basically, the idea here is what happens when you can close the space? What happens is those vectors don't go on endlessly in all directions. They now have a limit. You know, for the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, the whole idea of cosmos was uh, peron. They talked about the aperon, the unlimited. And the formation of cosmos for them was the limiting of the unlimited, the bounding of it. Because for them, the idea was you had just chaos flowing off forever if you didn't have some kind of container. Well, what happens when you contain something? You get what we would think of as dimensionality. And that would be for a two-dimensional one. This is simplifying. But if you think about um, land animals, they aren't too much concerned about height and depth. They are concerned about the area in which they, uh, uh, they uh, manage, uh, master space. Whereas uh, birds, you know, they're flying up in the air and they land. And fish are the best example. Because fish are in a purely three-dimensional area, except for maybe, I don't know, maybe there are some bottom dwellers that are territorial and don't ever leave the bottom. 
But there you have a uh, right, three-dimensional area of what constitutes a territory. So that's <coughs> why they say that it is dimensional. That's, that, you see, that's part of the really simple stuff that I'm real proud that I finally figured out. Uh, and then we're going to move on to the third one. And now I've got my neat little drawings. You remember that the line of flight opens a, a way out, but it's not where the former chaos was. And that's what I'm trying to do, demonstrate here. Okay, but then there's more that's going on here, and they say there is always a place, a tree, or grove in the territory where all the forces come together in a hand to hand combat of energies. Here they're relying on world mythology and uh, traditions. That there are, uh, Deleuze was very much interested in uh, uh, Eliade and his studies of mythology. Uh, if you've ever read the essay, the lectures of uh, Kesta what does it mean to found? He, there are notes of, from 1956. He rides heavily on Mircea Eliade's work and cites a lot of this kind of stuff and talks about founding. And basically, cultures will have this idea that there is some kind of central tree that is like you know, the sacred tree, or it is the, the sacred fire pit, or the cave, or something like that. And it's like where all the forces of the territory converge, but it's also a place where they all come forth. And in fact, in some cases, it's difficult to tell exactly where that center is. It's in the center, but it's somehow somewhere else, too. And so here's my convergence of forces. I like that. Actually, I couldn't get my Photoshop to work right, so I had to use uh, uh, PowerPoint, which wouldn't do arcs. They just do these squiggly lines. But actually, I think the results are OK. All right. But then we get the next thing, which is what I was just saying. This intense center is simultaneously inside the territory and outside several territories that converge on it at the end of an immense pilgrimage, hence the ambiguities of the natal. And they'll talk about that later. I won't go into it. Inside or out, the territory is linked to this intense center, which is like the unknown homeland terrestrial source of all forces, friendly and hostile, where everything is decided. And we won't write on this too hard. The example, though, they give of animals that have engaged in a line of flight are salmon returning to their spawning grounds, uh, lobsters that will go on thousand-mile marches, the gathering of eels in the Saragossa Sea, migratory birds. Clearly, they are territorial, but there's something about them that is leading them off on some kind of grand movement, and they see that as a kind of a manifestation of territory's line of flight component. OK. And there was my drawing, the complete image. All the forces coming in. Now that line of flight is connected with the inside. The inside is actually the outside. OK? It's paradoxical, um, but there it is. OK, uh, I don't know if I've got time to do much with this here. But they make a, a, an analogy between this and remarks that Paul Clay makes in his notebooks about what he calls the gray point. And I'll try to see, sort of hustle this here. Basically, what he says is chaos is not pure chaos. Chaos is always related to uh, cosmos. And this is, I think, something really important in Deleuze and Guattari's model. Think about it. You had chaos, you emerge in, in cosmos. Cosmos is not something, what is it? It's at home in the universe, in a sense. It is where no longer are you threatened with forces that are going to overwhelm you, but instead you now are able to open yourself to all kinds of relations that will connect you with the cosmos. And that's sort of what he is saying here. And uh, I'm going to move on to his definition of the. He says that the pictorial symbol of this non-concept of point of origin is the point that is really not a point. The mathematical point, and think about it, you know, the definition of a mathematical point is it's infinitely small. So there's a sense in which it really isn't. And that's what he says. He's interested in the emergence of line. And you'll see here what Deleuze and Guattari are doing is taking a musical notion and then providing a visual, pictorial notion of the same thing. And they say, really, Paul Clay is talking about the same thing we're talking about. Remember the point of order? He's going to say, Paul Clay says, it leaks out of itself. But at any rate, it is, a, it is the nowhere existent something, or the somewhere existent nothing, it is a non-conceptual concept. 
of freedom from opposition, if we express it in terms of the perceptible, as though drawing up a balance sheet of chaos, we arrive at the concept gray. At the fateful point between coming into being and passing away, the gray point. The point is gray because it is neither white nor black, or because it, or because it is white and black at the same time. You see how it is? It's a nothing something or a something nothing. It is that, what is it? It's at that amorphous bit of chaos that provides the germ for the emergence of the cosmos. Uh, and that's going to be really important for this whole idea of emergence <coughs> and origin in terms of Deleuze and Guattari's notion of the refrain. Okay, it is because it is neither up nor down, or because it is both and up and down, it is gray because it is neither hot nor cold, it is gray because it is non a non dimensional point, a point between the dimensions. You read this and it sounds so Deleuze and Guattari to me. And it's, of course, 20, 30 years before they were right. Okay, and then we get to the point when this little point sh sh jumps out of itself. The cosmogenetic moment is at hand. The establishment of a point in chaos, which concentrated in principle can only be great, lends this point a concentric character of the primordial. The order thus created it creates, radiates from it in all directions. And there, that's the notion of the point as being directional, I think. All right, I'll skip the second sentence there and move on to, here's a little drawing you made. These are not, this is not the point merging out of itself. It's got, uh, the top one is chaotic, the next one is cosmic uh, creative, the next one is cosmic development, and the last one is cosmic underdeveloped or something like that. But just thought they were kind of cool things to look at. All right, now I need to move to Miller's rhythms and codes. We started at 1037 or something like that. Is that right? Is Katarina in the room? No, okay. Well, I'll just keep going. All right, every milieu is vibratory. And now we're moving into, a, this, this is complex stuff, I think. But it, it, yeah, Ian. I was just going to say, they're talking about five minutes away from the morning tea reading here. So if you're, they're about five minutes away from the morning tea reading in there. So if you go for five. Go for five minutes, then stop. And then take then come back. time from my session if you want. I can easily just follow up what you're saying. Okay, cool. If I'll if stop, in, okay I'll stop in five minutes. I think so, because their coffee is yeah, thank you. Uh, and I'll I'll try to speed up afterwards. No, no, oh, okay. I'll, I all right. If, if I'll be want, here all day. No. Is it all ready now? I think five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, I'll go five. I've got a little clock here. So. <laughs> okay, and I can allow some of you to Thomas. You can be my monitor. Okay, so if you look at that, it's 11, 12, according to my clock. It's 17. Yeah. No, you just turn off the power. <laughs> no, because then i got to reboot and all that kind of stuff. Every milieu is vibratory. In other words, a block of space-time constituted by the periodic repetition of the component. Okay? So it is, what is it? Think about refrain. It's a musical idea. And we're getting to this idea of, of repetition and of, of, of rhythm. We're going to talk about a difference between rhythm and meter, which is something that Messina hands to Deleuze and Guattari. Okay, every milieu is coded, a code being defined by periodic repetition. Okay, so that's what defines a milieu. Milieu is the simplest of our three categories. We have milieu, and then we have territory, and then we have a way out of the territory. There are, all animals have milieu, umwelt is the word that uh, von Uexko uh, made popular to describe the surrounding world of an animal. And I'm going to show you an amoeba. An amoeba is a milieu animal. And it's not territorial. <coughs> so, but all animals have some kind of milieu. Actually, they have four. And this is something to list what I read from Gida uh, in, in part from von Uexko. OK, but no, here we have this notion of coding and decoding defined as periodic repetition. So whatever it is, you know, the animal is moving around in a certain way or it has its cyclical uh, eating habits, whatever. And that would be a coded repetition. Uh, and if you guys read difference in repetition, you know as soon as you see that word, we're in danger zone, right? Okay. Uh, but each code is in a perpetual state of transcoding or transduction. The word transduction is a word that they take from Gilbert Simondon, 
And uh, I don't have time to explain that to you, but uh, it's not quite the same thing as transcoding. But it's, it's an interesting concept. Okay, but that basically what it is is these are not just isolated things. They're always in, in interrelation with one another. Okay, transcoding or transduction is the manner in which one milieu serves as the basis for another. In other words, there is no milieu of all milieus. There is no milieu separated from any from other milieus in our natural world. Every creature has its milieu, but it's also part of some other milieu. And we can define each one of the creatures in terms of its relative milieu and then, of course, its kingdom connections and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Or conversely, is established on a top another milieu, dissipates in it, or is constituted in it. Those are other possibilities. We don't need to go into those. Okay. There are four milieus, and this is what they get from Simon Don. We have an interior and exterior milieu. Um, and I'll, that would be all the materials that surround the creature in question. An interior milieu, composing elements and composed substances. That's the most in Guattari's terms. Basically, your body has an interior milieu. You've got your heart, your lungs, your, all those other kinds of things that are working. And they form an interior milieu. And you guys are part of my exterior milieu, okay? Then we have the intermediary, that's the membrane. And that would be my skin, but it would be all the membranes inside as well. That is where we have a selective passage of materials in, materials out, a kind of a filtering process. And then we finally have the annexed milieu. And that is the idea of not, it, it, it's exterior, but it's a very specific kind of exteriority. That'd be the source of food, uh, nutrients, and action perceptions, such that, uh, you know, for, for a certain kind of creature, the annexed milieu would be more than just that exterior. It would be that exterior as action perception or sensor of motor schema reaction. And here's my amoeba with its interior milieu. We don't need to go into detail. And here it is, both external. I have water as milieu of locomotion. That would be the exterior. And I hope you can see it's strictly directional. It's not territorial. The amoeba just moves around wherever it moves around. And it does actually react to things in the, the uh, environment. You put a poison at it, it even, learn, it even learns not to go there. It's amazing what amoebas can do. The, the annex would be water as bearer of nutrients. And then finally, this is not going to help you much, but that is the, the membrane of a, uh, an, an amoeba. So there we go. Let's see what's next step. <laughs> For new school, time to time to quit. Okay, I've got 11:17. We'll be back. <coughs>
of this bag. So, so much for all of this. Oh, yeah. This is going to be no fun. Okay, I'm going to have to do everything from Control Central here. Are those double A or triple A? Uh, they're double A. Can't help me. Can't help me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, who knew? All right, so at any rate, here we are for that. And let's see, move on here. Uh, the first thing is when you hear this word territory, uh, you should realize that there are really two basic, con uh, basic notions of territory. The, the term itself appears for the first time in Lantiedip, anti-Oedipus, and here's a, this is the general sense of the term. You've heard of territorialization, re-territorialization, de-territorialization, that's the big concept. Everything can be understood in terms of re-territorialization, de-territorialization. And the initial use of the uh, concept of territory, I think, is in that first of the three machines, the social machines that are outlined in chapter three of Anti-Oedipus. You remember there we have the primitive socius, we have the despotic, and then we have the capitalist. And the first of those is said to be a territorial machine. And here's a quote that um, it, it's lifted out of context and I could spend probably a half an hour talking about it, but I won't. The earth is the primitive, savage unity of desire and production. And remember, all the way through, earth, en français, c'est terre. So territoire, terre. There's always that very close link that gets, you miss in English. Okay? Okay. Uh, for the earth is not merely the multiple and divided object of labor, and there they're talking sort of Marxian kind of talk, right? It is also the unique indivisible entity, the full body that falls back on the forces of production and appropriates them for its own as the natural or divine precondition, the refrain plateau. And I think you'll see when we, after reviewing the description of territory, when we review things that Messiaen says about music, they, they lift all kinds of things right out of Messiaen, or shall we say they are uh, compatible uh, companions. Uh, and I'll conclude, but the, the emphasis will be on a specific piece of music. The Cadillac Oiseau, uh, piece two from the book, or piece three from book one, Le Merle Bleu, which uh, I didn't know in English is the blue rock thrush. That's the name of a bird. I asked uh, Catalina's mother this morning what it was. She speaks it. I don't know what it is in Portuguese. But at any rate, we'll do that. And then the third day will be probably the least relevant to my topic. Uh, it will just be for my amusement. And that will be uh, Silvana Busotti. Ian um, knows a little bit about this since he's seen the article that I've written on the opening image of a thousand plateaus on the uh, rhizome. Some of you have looked at that crazy score. That's by Silvana Busotti. And the Deleuze and Guattari misspelled his last name. And the translator is very faithful and mistranslate and misspells the name also. There are two T. The basic idea here is, <clears throat> is it? I understand that I'm supposed to talk about territory. So today is going to be Territory 101. It's going to be probably stuff that some of you already know very well. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, if I insult your intelligence, uh, my apologies. Uh, otherwise, it, it probably doesn't hurt to review some of this stuff. I don't know. I've been reading, reading this material for a long time, and I find it difficult. And I don't know if that's just my own challenge to burn. But uh, one. When I started working on Deleuze, I don't know, 25, too many years ago, uh, one of my goals was to understand every sentence. And uh, I still don't understand every sentence. But every once in a while, a new sentence will make, I'll be able to decipher. And so I hope that occasionally I will make uh, uh, in, uh, coherent to you something that previously was not coherent. 